Hi, everyone, and thanks so much for stopping by. Uh, this video is meant to be an introduction to statistics uh, and reviewing a lot of the key concepts and topics from chapter one in our textbook offered by Hawks Learning. So um, a lot of this material, this being a math class, you might think, oh my goodness, where's the math at? Um, a lot of the material in this first chapter is vocabulary. So there's not a whole lot of mathematics that we're going to be looking at. So an interesting way to start a statistics class. Now, I don't want you to be equally dismissive of the uh, vocabulary because it will come back to us uh, much later in the semester. So it is important to take note of these things. So what we're going to be looking at is try to define what statistics is, um, trying to understand how we set up a study, some terminology along the way, some examples, um, and a few other odds and ends um, from our textbook. So one of the questions you might be wondering is what exactly is statistics? And what a lot of people think of is, well, it's a bunch of data. And while that is true, there are actually two definitions of statistics. So the first is a literal science um, of gathering, describing, and analyzing data. So it is a branch of mathematics. So we have, for example, in our department, um, several faculty who are statisticians, and it's their job to sort of develop these new ideas around gathering, describing, and analyzing data. Um, and the second definition is the actual numerical descriptions of sample data. So in other words, literal data. So you might hear people say um, stock market statistics or the price uh, of a particular, let's say, gallon of milk. Okay, what do those statistics look like? Or sports statistics, right? Baseball, football, hockey, basketball, uh, et cetera. Now, if you're very good at asking questions, um, this is the branch of mathematics for you, okay? So statistics is all about asking questions. We get the data, we put it in our hands, and we say, okay, so what? What does it tell us? What doesn't it tell us? Um, all sorts of questions that we can be asking. So there's a, a, a word cloud um, that has been created here. And the question is, what words do you see? And so here's a, a larger version of that. And so if you if you pause and just take a look at some of the words that are, that are floating around here, um, a lot of things that are very useful for you and I. So you may see data, you may see collection, interpretation. I see probability on there. I see prediction, experiments, theory. Um, modeled, gained, models direct, thinking, planning, et cetera. So lots of things that go into this idea of statistics, not just as a branch of mathematics, but also as a set of actual data. Now, once we sort of enter into an area that we're interested in learning more about, so everyone in this class is a different major, you may have a different uh, sort of set of interests. Those of you heading into the medical fields, you may have particularly particular things that you're interested in, such as cancer research or uh, things that have to do with optometry or dentistry, et cetera. So there are many of them. So, so what then motivates our study? Okay, well, we try to, to sort of begin with identifying something to study. And so we generally will center this around a topic, and then we want to form a question. And you might often hear people say, I'm working on my research question, developing the research question. So research questions are very, very important for uh, the work. Now, for myself, um, at least at the, at the time this video was made, uh, I am a PhD candidate at Wayne State University, and I am working on, at the moment, um, my research proposal. The prospectus is what that's called. And so I have had to think about my research questions uh, very much, okay, as they sort of work to frame my study, because then everything else that you develop, how you collect your data, et cetera, has to follow from those. And so my interest here is mathematics education, STEM, et cetera. So I have to come up with some kind of proposal that I can actually do my dissertation research on. And that dissertation research is going to involve data collection, right? But in order for us to figure out the sort of data collection pieces and tools, um, you have to kind of understand what exactly is your question, right? So everything kind of begins with all right, what are you interested in, in knowing more about uh, with, with regards to, at least for me, mathematics education and STEM? So that's really the gist of this, right? What is it that we want to know? So um, sometimes we call this a problem statement, uh, a purpose and research questions. We kind of loop it up 
together, especially in the first uh, chapter of a dissertation. Um, and the questions themselves have to be very, very specific. And it does require a lot of editing and thought. And the reason is because you want your questions to be measurable. Okay, so what does that mean measurable? Well, I have to be able to collect data in order to answer the question. That's the whole point of your study. You want your study to be able to answer your question. So these are my research questions, at least at present. Um, the first one here is what structures are in place for supporting STEM GTAs in teaching at an institution of higher education? So GTA, if you don't know, is a graduate teaching assistant. So these are folks who have uh, an earned bachelor's degree. Some of them have a master's degree and they're working on either a master's or a PhD. And as part of their requirements, um, they take classes. They may also teach classes while working on uh, their degree. So I'm focusing on their experience as instructors. Now look at my question, what structures are in place? That is something that we can go and measure. I can find the answer to this. Okay. And you might say, well, how will you find the answer to this? Well, think about it. How can I figure out what sort of structures are in place to support STEM GTAs in teaching? Okay. Well, I could look that up on a website. I could get that information from people who are in charge. I can get that in interviews, right? So a number of different ways um, I can obtain that. The second research question that I have is how do STEM GTA seek out support, if any, for teaching? Okay, so you might say, all right, well, how will you measure this? Well, I can ask these GTAs, um, how, do you, how do you get help? How do you get support if you have a teaching issue, right? This is something that they can explain either in an interview uh, or some kind of survey. Now, I do have some sub questions. Sometimes we have to do this to sort of understand this question a bit more. So what forms of support do STEM GTA seek out and their frequency and from where? Um, which do they feel are essential? And what are the factors that sort of motivate or not motivate them uh, to seeking out this support? So these are all things that I can get from uh, the STEM GTAs in the, in the study, uh, such as through interviews, et cetera. And then finally, what are the uh, teaching self-efficacies uh, of STEM GTAs? And certainly are there differences uh, among them based on discipline, and semesters, et cetera? So um, these are, again, my questions. Uh, it is a bit more complex because it is a PhD study, right? It's for dissertation. Um, but each of these questions is something that is measurable. I can actually get the answers to them in one way or the other. Now, once we have our research questions obtained, um, what follows next is figuring out who the research group is. And so for mine, it was pretty obvious. I kind of knew sort of as I was developing the research questions who I wanted to go after or focus on, okay? And that really is an important thing because what you're doing here is identifying your population, okay? So who do you want to know this information about? What sort of things do you want to know? So my questions kind of drew that out quite a bit. Now, the question also we have to answer is, uh, how large is, is this group going to be? Okay, and so this again gets us to this notion of a population that we are interested in. Um, so is it possible to conduct research on an entire population of people? All right, well, let's suppose we, we say we are interested in studying the folks ages 12 to 18 in K-12 schools in Michigan. Can we get to every single one of these individuals? Okay, uh, age 12 to 18 in all the K-12 schools in Michigan? Um, you need a pretty big research team, I think, uh, in order to make that happen. But you see, the problem that we have is that the population is so large. So my population is all of the STEM GTAs, okay, at institutions. Well, I don't have the ability to get around to all of them. So this gets to this idea of population versus sample. So now we're getting into some of that vocabulary. So the group we're very much so interested in we call the population, right? It's the group of interest and the population can be small. Uh, it certainly can be very, very large, okay? It just depends. I could, for example, declare the population to be everyone in my stats 1020 class, okay? That would amount to about 35 students, okay? Now, if the population is so large, um, then we need to take a smaller, what we call a subset of the population and the subset is called a sample. And this is where we collect the data, okay? So the sample, the, the framing that I use, how I word it is I can put my hands on the sample. In other words, I can get the data from anybody in my sample. I can extract that data from them, put it in my hands and try to make sense of it. From the population, it's a bit more difficult because it's a much larger group. 
So the, the diagram that we often look at here is that the sample is contained in the population, okay? That's an important piece to this because you don't wanna draw a sample that's not from your population, okay? So if I'm looking at STEM GTAs, I don't want to include folks from, I don't know, uh, the arts, right? GTAs who may be in the art department. That's not in the group I am interested in studying. It doesn't mean I'm not interested in them, but in the moment I'm studying uh, just STEM GTA, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. That's my focus. A few slides ago, we had uh, K-12 students aged 12 to 18 in, in public schools in Michigan. Okay. Somebody says, well, what happens if you do Ohio? Well, that's not in the population. Okay, so there is important thing that the sample has to come from the population. Now, as we begin to gather data um, from the sample and thereby the population, um, there is some vocabulary that can help us. So one of the things we tend to look at are variables. These are characteristics that change from uh, a member, uh, member to member of a particular population. So in my case, if I'm looking at STEM GTAs, um, I can give you several different variables. One is the discipline that they're studying. Uh, second would be the degree program. Um, third could be the number of classes, or, or excuse me, progression in the program. So number of years they've been a GTA or not. Uh, prior teaching experience. Um, the types of courses that they've taught, et cetera. So lots of different examples. Um, other, other things that we can look at more generally uh, for variables could be height, weight, eye color. Um, if we're considering, let's say, university students, GPA, major, class standing, um, community you're coming from, right, high school, those sorts of things. And what we, what we get from looking at the... Um, uh, individuals in our sample are data, okay? And these are the literal counts and measurements, observations, et cetera, that are gathered um, about particular variables. And data does not have to mean uh, actual numbers, okay? It can be written down notes, okay? That, that counts as data, it could be interview data. So paragraphs of, of transcripts, that's considered data, okay? So it does not have to just be literal numbers on the paper. All of that counts um, as data. Um, if folks are using, let's say, photography as part of their, their study, um, the, the photos would be considered data as well. So a bit interesting to think about it in that way. Now, the vocabulary we're looking at here on this slide is also very important. Excuse me, is very important. Um, you have to know the difference between a parameter and a statistic. So a parameter is a numerical description of a population characteristic, okay? So it is uh, something that's describing the population. And this should be easy to remember because parameter and population start with the same letter, P, okay? So often we will say population parameter. So parameters describe the population. Statistic, um, it's something that's describing the sample, okay? So statistics describe the sample. That's easy to remember because that begins both words with S, sample statistics. So statistics describe the sample, parameters describe population. So what is an example of this? Well, let's suppose I'm interested in the average GPA um, for incoming freshmen at institutions in Michigan, okay? So the parameter would be that average, Okay, so we would have to consider every single one of those incoming freshmen, okay, and get their average GPA. Um, a sample would be me going and, I don't know, maybe taking 100 students from Wayne State, 100 students from Northern Michigan, and 100 students from uh, Western Michigan, and taking their average uh, GPA. That would be a statistic because it's coming from the sample. Okay, so there is difference between parameter and statistic. So very important we understand that distinction. Now, if we compare the population and the sample um, sort of side by side, it's important to note some distinctions. So the population, of course, refers to the entire group that we're interested in. The sample is only part of it, okay? Um, the population is the group that we want to know more about, okay? And the sample is who we do know some things about. And the reason we know it is, again, because I can put my hands on that data, right? I can I can actually go to the sample and get that data. Um, we call the characteristics parameters for the population, and they're called statistics for the sample. We just talked about this. Um, parameters are generally unknown. This is a bit interesting. You might say, well, wait a second. A moment ago, you said 
um, we could get the average GPA for all college students or incoming freshmen rather um, at universities and colleges in Michigan. Isn't that something that we could actually figure out? And the answer to that question is yes. Okay, so that would be an instance where we would know what that parameter is. However, generally when we think about populations, we tend to think of them as being very, very large. And it's sometimes it's difficult to get to everybody in the population. And so as a result, we generally don't know what the parameters are. We do, however, know what the statistics are, and that's because it's coming from the sample, okay? And you're, again, hearing me say this, I can put my hands on everybody in that sample to get the data. So I know all about my sample, okay, very, very much so. Now, parameters um, we generally think of as being fixed, and the reason is because there's only one population, okay? So so whatever the parameter is, it's, it's not going to change, okay? Statistics, however, are going to change with the sample, okay? Now, a moment ago, I said I was going to go get the average GPA of incoming freshmen at Northern Michigan, Western Michigan, and Wayne State. If I change that to Wayne State, University of Michigan, and I don't know, Lake Superior State, now we have three different groups, right? Okay, so the statistics might be different, okay? So it's going to vary sample the sample. Now, one of the things we try to do as much as possible when we collect data um, is we want what's called a representative sample, okay? And what this means is that I want my sample to look and feel as much like the population as possible. We don't want any kind of favoring, okay, of one group or another. So uh, we have to try to make sure that the sample is as reflective of the population as possible. And this is difficult for many different reasons. Um, sometimes people may not want to participate in the study. Sometimes uh, it just it just doesn't work. Okay, so we, we do want to make sure that we have a, as representative of a sample as possible. Now, you might be wondering, well, what's an example of this? Very simple. Um, if I am interested in let's say, forming opinions uh, of Wayne State students on, I don't know, the cost of parking, okay? And I'm only interested in looking at the undergraduate population um, at Wayne State. And I said, well, I don't have time to get to all multiple thousands of you that are, that are on campus. Um, but I am concerned to make sure that I have the proper balance of class standing. So in other words, I ask the right number of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, okay? And if I look online and I find out what the percentage breakdown of that is for the entire undergraduate population, then I'm going to want my representative sample to reflect those same percentages as close as possible. So for example, if I know that 30% of the undergraduate population are sophomores, then my sample also needs to be close to 30% sophomores as well. And the other class standings would have to be reflected in that way. Um, that would be a more representative sample. Because um, if I went and I asked everybody who's a senior, okay, in my sample, and then tried to infer about that, we have a problem. And that is because those of the seniors have been here longer, they're probably tired of paying parking, right? So there's a little bit of bias uh, that, that exists there. So that's what we mean by representative sample. Now, um, in order to get the sample, um, we have some ways to do this. And the big thing here is the word random. We want randomization as much as possible. And the reason is to reduce bias. And I hope you all wrote that down. So in order to reduce any kind of bias in sampling, we need to use randomization. So randomization reduces bias. Again, hope you wrote that down. Um, so a random sample means that everybody has equal chance of being selected. Okay, and there are many different ways to do this. Uh, you could use a random number generator to randomly select people. You could pull names out of a hat, just something where there's equally likely chance of being selected. Um, a simple random sample involves us selecting samples from the population so that they have an equal chance of being selected. So a little bit more of a broader sort of sampling technique. So random sample is us selecting each individual member. Simple random sample is us selecting uh, specific samples, okay? Now, again, why do we want randomness? That awkward silence was you hopefully saying to reduce bias. Okay, that could be a test question, just saying. Now, we do have problems with sampling. Um, sometimes we have what's called a convenient sample, and this is, the, this is a sample that's chosen because it's convenient to the researcher. Okay, so for example, if I was interested in knowing everyone's opinions on parking, uh, cost of parking at Wayne State's campus, and I went and asked 
only my three classes or four classes that I'm teaching, this would be a convenient sample. Okay. And the problem is that it may not be representative of the entire student population uh, on campus. Right. So we may not have a breakdown, for example, of the class standing. We may have one gender over another that's being represented. We may have certain majors that are a majority um, and, and those sorts of things. So convenient samples have some issues. We also have something called a census. This is where we attempt to get data from everybody in the population. Okay, and the question here is, is it possible to obtain data from every member of a population? If you think about the US census that's conducted every 10 years, um, we have some problems. And the problem is that we can't necessarily go and count every single person because we know unfortunately that we have in our society individuals who are homeless, okay, who may not have an address. We may have folks who are living off the grid, okay, where it's impossible uh, to find and or reach them. So the question is, is our, is our census necessarily accurate uh, in that respect? So a bit difficult uh, depending on how large our population is. Now, the next thing you have to decide um, is what sort of study are you going to conduct, okay? And in this class, we learn about two different types of studies. The first is observational, and the second is an experiment. So observational studies, this is where data is observed, and the data technically already exists, okay? Um, we'll talk about what that means in a minute. Experiments, these generate data and they help to identify a cause and effect relationship. And again, if you're if you're taking notes with this, you better write that that down. Experiments are the only things that identify or establish cause and effect relationships. That's going to come back to us in chapter 12 at the end of the semester. So it's important to remember the only way to establish cause and effect is with an experiment. OK, experiments are the only things that do cause and effect relationships. Okay, so um, what we've done so far in, in sort of understanding uh, the statistical study is sort of understanding the question. Okay, kind of frame that, uh, gave you my research questions uh, that I'm thinking about. Determining the population and the variables, the sampling method, um, and then what follows that is the collecting the data, the organizing the data, and the analyzing. So we've only talked about one A, B, and C so far. So how do we collect data, organize, and analyze the data? Well, that is something to come up a bit later. So we will learn how to do a little bit of data collection in future classes that you may take, because some of these things may be discipline specific. So how our friends in the medical fields collect data is going to be different than how our friends in the social sciences collect data. Um, but ultimately, many of these could involve surveys and polls and questionnaires. I think everyone has participated in these in one way or the other. Uh, measurement devices, ranking devices, standardized tests. Um, certainly other ones that I could have added here are interviews. Okay, kind of pull that out through a questionnaire, survey, interview could be seen as, as something like that. Or even general observations too. Okay, that is a form of collecting uh, a data that we sometimes don't think about. Now, for number three, about how we display the data, we'll look at that actually in the next chapter, okay, with the different graphs. Um, and then formally, the sort of data analysis part, um, that will come out a little bit later in some of the other chapters uh, that we're going to be examining this semester. Uh, and this is essentially what researchers do all day, okay? So uh, those of you heading into those areas, that's what you're looking forward to be doing, so... A little bit of other vocabulary. Researchers have a tendency to also use cross-section studies. Okay, this is where they study something at a particular snapshot in time. Uh, so you, you're taking an exam in my class would be a wonderful example of this. Gives me an idea of where you stand at a particular moment. Okay, um, and on the other side of this, we also use a longitudinal study, um, and this is where we study sort of something over a long period of time. And it doesn't have to be a few days; it could be many years. Uh, so there are often researchers um, who do longitudinal studies to, uh, let's say, look at migration routes of, of different mammals. Um, I watched something on National Geographic on Disney Plus uh, a few weeks ago on whale migration. Uh, and there were researchers who've been studying that for years, what the whales do. So uh, very interesting stuff. Um, the final exam that you guys will be taking uh, certainly is an example of this. It shows me how much you've learned over the 14 weeks of the semester. And as a matter of fact, if we consider all of your data from start to finish in the semester, that also could be looked at as a longitudinal study uh, for how you have grown uh, from 
the beginning of the semester to, to the end. Um, many prescription drug studies fall into longitudinal studies, and the, the question here is why. Um, that should be obvious that, obviously, if it's a drug, um, they want to make sure that the results, side effects, et cetera, are all consistent, uh, especially over long periods of time. So that's why it often takes a long time for prescription drugs to make it out onto the market. All right, so so far we've learned a lot about the basic steps for setting up a statistical study, and certainly there are a lot more uh, details that go into that, and that will depend, again, on your disciplines. And that involves research questions, identifying populations and samples, um, looking at the how we sort of put the sample together, the vocabulary, all of those sorts of things. So uh, lots of, of work ahead of you if you're looking to go into graduate study for master's or PhD, because uh, that's what you'll be looking to, to do. And it gets, again, to the idea of statistics, which is all about, again, asking those questions about the data. So um, with the overview complete, let's go back to the book and work through some of the uh, textbook problems um, that are here. This will be helpful for you, especially for homework and exams and the final. So section 1.1 was a lot about vocabulary populations and samples, et cetera. So um, here's the first one. It says, in a survey, 359 college students at the University of Jackson were asked if they had tried the October flavor of the month at the campus coffee shop. 83 of the students surveyed said yes. So we want to know who's the population and who's the sample. So you will need to be able to do this on homework tests and the final. OK, so for the population, the question is, who is is being targeted here. Who are we interested in? Who do we want to know more about? And the answer is the, all of the college students at the University of Jackson. So once again, that little word, all, A-L-L, -L, all college students at the University of Jackson. That is the population here. That's who I am interested in. Now, the question is, who's the sample? So who actually did they put their hands on? And that would be the 359 college students, okay? Some people might think, well, what about the 83? Well, that's how many said yes, but the sample was 359. Okay, that's who we were asking. That's who got the survey. We don't know what happened to the other students in the survey. Maybe some said no, they don't like it or haven't tried it. Um, maybe some didn't answer. Okay, but it's the sample here is the 359. Part B says we have a survey of 1,125 households in the United States uh, found that 24% subscribe to satellite radio. So who is the group we are interested in here? Uh, that would be all households in the United States. So once again, all, A-L-L, -L, all households in the United States. That's the population. Um, the sample here, okay, well, well, who did they survey? And the answer would be the 1,125 households, okay? Again, the 24%, well, that's that's a result. That's not the sample. That's a result, okay? So hopefully you see the difference here between population and sample. So sample specific number, population, we have to describe a bit more broadly. And again, I'm using that word all. Okay, um, this one we're going to look at, again, the population and the sample. Um, and then what we need to do is one extra step, which is to determine whether or not that highlighted value, which in this case is 78%, um, is representing a parameter or a statistic. So why don't you do this? Why don't you pause the video and give this one a try on your own? Okay, let's see how you did. So in this particular example, um, the population here would be all American air travelers. That's who we are concerned with, okay? So all American air travelers. The sample here um, would be the 542 American air travelers who were interviewed, okay? That's the sample. Those are the individuals that this group, Gallup organization, put their hands on and talked to. Now, to determine whether or not we have a parameter or a statistic is interesting, okay? So let's read the last sentence here. It says, the report stated that 78% of American air travelers are in favor of the U.S. airports using full body scan imaging on airline passengers. Okay, so this is the report stated that 78% of American air travelers. It does not say that this was the result of the sample. So in other words, it doesn't say from the sample, 78% of blah, blah, blah. This says 78% of 
American air travelers. This is referencing the population. So for that reason, this 78% would be a parameter, not a statistic here. They did not say anywhere here that that number is coming from those they interviewed. So it's a little bit strange, I know, but this Gallup organization is making an inference on what the parameter is. 78% is the parameter. All right, why don't you give this one a shot? Same instructions. Okay, let's see how you did on this one. So we have similar um, circumstances, but this one is a different reporting uh, group. So this is the Rasmussen, okay, report. So who, again, is the population here? Who are they interested in? Well, that would be all adult Americans, okay? So all adult Americans, that's the group we are interested in. Who is the sample? Uh, well, it says the National Telephone Survey of 1,000 Adult Americans. So there it is. We talked to 1,000 adult Americans. That then is the sample. And what we need to figure out then is what does 59% represent? Is that coming from the parameter or the statistics? So is it coming from the population or is it describing the sample? So in this case, it says that the National Telephone Survey of 1,000 Adult Americans found Okay, so what that tells me is this is coming from the survey. This is coming from the sample. So that 59% has to be the statistic here because it's referencing the 1,000 individuals in the sample. So 59% is the statistic. It's coming from the sample. So very tricky here. Hopefully you all are following this because these would be very good questions, again, for homework, exams, and the final. Now, um, within statistics, we also have two different branches. One is descriptive and the other is inferential. So descriptive statistics are really the statistics that do the describing. Okay, so that's the, the gathering, sorting, summarizing, and displaying of the data. All right, chapters two and three and part of chapter 12 deal with descriptive statistics in this class. The other side of this is what we know as inferential statistics, and this is where we try to make an inference. So in other words, we collect a whole bunch of data, we look at it using the descriptive statistics, and then we try to infer about what the population is doing. Okay, and so we try to estimate our population parameter. So inferential statistics will be chapter 8 and 10 in this class. You might say, well, what about 4, 5, and 6? Uh, 4, 5, and 6 is what I call the transition time. There's some things and skills that we need in order to help us with the inferential statistics. All right, so what our job here is to identify whether or not we have um, descriptive or inferential statistics that are used in the excerpt of a particular article. Okay, so it says AOL had 900 journalists, 500 of them, at its local patch news operation, and by the end of 2011, Bloomberg expects to have 150 journalists and analysts for its new Washington operation, uh, Bloomberg government. Okay, so is this more descriptive or is this inferential? Where uh, do we see these pieces here? Well, the first sentence, uh, AOL had 900 journalists, 500 of them at its local patch news operation. This is descriptive, right? It's telling us about the data. We had 900, 500 of the 900 are at this local uh, news operation. So that's the descriptive statistic here that's being described for us, okay? The second sentence where it says Bloomberg expects, this is an inference, right? This is us trying to look into the future, right? What's, what's going to happen, Bloomberg? This is more inferential statistics. So Bloomberg expects to have 150 journalists, et cetera, that is inferential. That's us making an inference, or Bloomberg, rather, making an inference. Okay, section 1.3 um, deals with different types of studies. Okay, so this is important for us to be able to figure out um, uh, in various scenarios. So it says neurologists want to study the effect of vitamin C on nerve disorders, and the goal of the study is to see if taking an intravenous dose of vitamin C is going to reduce the amount of nerve pain reported by patients. And we want to identify the population of interest and any variables in the study. Okay, so who exactly are we interested in here knowing more about? Okay, well, it's not exactly clear um, the group that's being targeted, right? It doesn't give us a certain... Um, um, 
age group or gender or geographical area. Um, it just talks about here nerve disorders, okay? And then we have patients. So, so if I were to sort of put those clues together, I would say that the population are all those patients or individuals who suffer from nerve disorders. So again, population here would be all of those individuals who suffer from nerve disorders, okay? Um, and then we want to know different variables. So what could be things that the researchers, neurologists in this case, um, would have to sort of understand or know about this population? Okay, so I think the most obvious of which is the pain amount, okay, or level of pain that's reported by patients. That's a variable, okay? Everybody could report varying levels of this. Um, and that's because that's what they're trying to study. So that's an obvious thing. Okay. Um, what else do you know about the population? Well, um, certainly age might play a factor, um, weight, gender, uh, family history. Okay. Anytime you deal with med medical uh, uh, experiments like this, there are things that we have to consider. Um, maybe even the type of treatment, maybe the dosage, how much vitamin C they're getting, that could, that could be something that might vary. Okay, we don't have that information here, but again, we're brainstorming. Um, how about length of time that the person receives the, the vitamin C dosage, the frequency? Okay, so frequency and also how long, over what period of time, et cetera. Okay, so certainly other variables, perhaps others you've, you've listed. Now, it says, which type of study would you conduct, um, an observational study or an experiment? Okay, so I said we would return to what, is, again, is the difference here. So observational means that we are watching, literally, um, and it also implies that the data that we're looking at already exists. So what does that mean that it exists? We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Experiments, what do they do again? I hope you wrote this down. Establish cause and effect. Okay, very important. Part A, you want to determine the average age of college students across the nation. Okay. Um, truth be told, am I doing any kind of cause in relationship here with getting the average age of college students? Uh, the answer should be no. Right. There, there's no groups I'm separating everybody into, et cetera. This is just what's your age. OK, your age exists. OK, my age at the present time exists. OK, so this is data that is already there. OK, now you might say, well, well, you have to get it. And I'd say, absolutely. OK, and then the question is, well, how do you get the average age of college students across the nation? Well, you can ask them. OK, right. So that is data that exists, and you're getting the data from the individual, okay? So it's not something that is, uh, you know, we're, we're generating on our own. No, 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 it's, it's there, it's somewhere. It's either in the database at the universities and colleges, or it's with the individual. Either way, we can get it from them. So this would be considered an observational study. Part B says that researchers wish to determine if flu shots actually help prevent severe cases of the flu, okay? So this idea of preventing severe cases of the flu. So in other words, is the flu shot causing you and I to not get the flu or at least severe cases of the flu, okay? For this reason, it would be an experiment because what we would need to do is set up two groups, one group who gets the flu shot, one who doesn't, and we see who and how many within those two groups get severe cases of the flu. So that would be, uh, on the, at least in the basic form, uh, an experiment here. So we're looking for a cause and effect relationship. Now we need to explore experiments a bit more um, because experiments have different components to them. So the first part to this is some sort of treatment, okay? So using the flu shot example, the, the treatment would be the flu shot, okay? Um, uh, because that's what we're trying to see, okay? Uh, that it evokes some sort of response, okay? Um, and if we're setting up a, a true experiment, we'd have a treatment and what we call a control group. And so the folks in the control group would also get a treatment. It would be a control, okay? Maybe a, a, if, if, if we're administering the vaccine as a shot, they would also get a shot that looks and feels like the actual flu shot, but it might be a, I don't know, uh, some nonsense supplement, okay? Something that has no impact um, on the individuals. Now, the folks who are involved in the experiment, we call subjects, okay? So these are the people that are being studied. 
uh, participants are also individuals um, who are being studied. So sometimes we may use the word subjects uh, or participants, just depending. Okay. Um, and then we have two variables that we call response and explanatory. And this is going to come back in chapter 12 as well. The response variable is the dependent variable. The explanatory variable is the independent. And what's happening here is we try to identify an explanatory variable that does the explaining. And then there's a variable that responds, and that's the response variable. So the flu shot, the flu vaccination, um, that would be considered the explanatory variable. And the response variable would be the number of severe cases of the flu one would get. In the previous one we had with the vitamin C, um, the explanatory variable would be the dosage of vitamin C, and the response variable would be the sort of the level of pain that's reported by patients, right? That's what we're trying to understand that is going to be impacted. So whatever is getting impacted is the response variable. Now, when we put experiments together, um, there are some important aspects of this, at least in the basic sense, that we want to try to make sure that we keep in mind, okay? Now, when you move on from my class and you take other statistics classes or courses that are related to more research study in your discipline, um, these will get more complicated because there'll be other aspects of experimental design that you'll need to consider, especially if you're headed into the medical side of things. Okay, um, So the first principle that we look at is randomize the control and treatment groups. Why do we use randomization? I hope we wrote this down. To reduce bias. Okay, so what this is saying is that when I assign people to a control and treatment group, I want to do it randomly. I don't want them to know which group they're in, because obviously that's going to ruin my experiment. So I just going to randomly assign them to one of these groups. The second is to control for outside effects on the response variable. Okay, so how would we control for these sorts of things? Well, it depends. Depends what the outside effects are going to be. If we know that age, for example, um, let's say older individuals have a tendency to get the flu a lot more, I'm not going to put all of the uh, older folks in the control group. Okay, I'm going to mix them between the control and the treatment group. I'm going to try to make sure that they have equal distributions in both and then give them the flu shot. That is one way of controlling for that, right? This way, both groups have some older individuals. If I know, for example, specific um, age groups, again, okay, try to balance that. Maybe younger people have issues. We try to balance them in both groups. If we know folks from various geographic regions, we try to put both in control and treatments. Family history, right? This is how we control for these outside effects. Number three um, is to replicate the experiment a significant number of times and to see if we have any meaningful patterns. So. This is typical in um, uh, studies that involve prescription drugs. We understand that we don't just do one experiment, declare that the drug works, and it goes on the market. No, no, no. We have to do many, many trials, many independent trials. And what we're looking for is to make sure that the results are repeated, okay, um, that, that the drug is reacting or giving the side effects that we want. In other words, it's doing what we want it to do, either fighting the disease or illness uh, in, in question, okay? And so we want to make sure that those results are definitely repeated over and over again in the positive side of things. So we have a control group. These are the individuals who, again, don't get any treatment, okay? Um, they still get something that may look like the actual treatment, okay? So if the treatment group is actually getting a blue pill, the control group is also going to get a blue pill, okay? If the treatment group has to get a blue pill and do 3,000 push-ups, the control group is going to do exactly the same thing, okay? And so what we try to do is to control these confounding variables um, that can sort of affect or impact subjects in the experiment. So we have to be mindful of these lurking variables. So I talked about a couple already. So if we're talking about, let's say, flu vaccines, age group can make a difference. Uh, gender could make a difference. Geographical area, family history. These are all lurking variables that can confound our results. So we have to be mindful of these things. Now, we also have something called a placebo effect. So if you recall me saying a moment ago that if the treatment group gets a blue pill, the control group also gets a blue pill. That is a, called a placebo. Okay, So it's, it's something that's absolutely 100% identical to the treatment, but there are no 
benefits to it at all. So it could have, let's say, a um, you know, a water pill or sugar pill or something like that. So just just nothing essentially. Um, and this has a tendency to um, lead into what's called the placebo effect, and it's it's just the, a weird psychological thing that can happen with people that even though they're they're getting a placebo, they can still feel the same sort of results as the treatment. So if if this blue pill is meant to reduce headaches, okay, and I'm in the control group and I'm getting a placebo, which is a water pill, and I take it. Um, and I report that I didn't have any headache, I am then sort of falling into this placebo effect. So it's very interesting to see that. That's why we have two different groups, okay? And we take this into consideration when we analyze things. Um, more vocabulary, we have single blind and double blind experiments. What's the idea here? Single blind means that as an individual in the study, I have no idea which group I'm in, okay? So I do whatever the researchers tell me. They give me a pill, it could be the placebo. It could be the actual treatment. I don't know. Okay, Who does know is the person administering the treatment. Okay, So the researcher will know. So there's some risk there because if the researcher treats the individuals in the study differently, depending on which group they're in, this has implication for bias. So single blind has a risk. In double blind, nobody has an idea of which group everybody's in. So the researcher doesn't, the person administering that treatment doesn't, um, and the folks in the study have no idea either. Only the person behind the curtain really knows what's going on, okay? So if you're really looking to reduce bias 100%, double blind is the way to go, okay? This way, the, the researcher, the person administering the treatment doesn't know as well as the participants. What you're looking at here um, is a diagram for what we call a randomized comparative experiment. It kind of talks about everything that we've we've listed so far. This is very basic. Um, what we're looking at is finding 30 students who are looking to do some sort of mode of instruction. So this is a curriculum based sort of thing. We randomly assign them to two groups and we give them either treatment one, which is in the classroom, which we could consider to be the control group, since that's the typical way instruction is delivered. And treatment two would be the actual treatment, which is a self-paced uh, uh, course. At the end, we compare. That's an important thing that we have to do. So at the end here, they take a common final and we analyze the score. So at the end of this, there has to be a comparison. How did the control group do versus the treatment group? Okay, so again, this is a very basic comparative design. There are other comparative experiment designs that can be developed. Some of them involve block design, for example, where you group individuals by characteristic uh, and more. So these can get very, very complicated, but uh, this is the most basic of the diagram. So you can actually look this up if you want in a Google search and see the different types of design mechanisms. Um, if you're working with people who are doing research, um, I would ask them about the types of comparative experiments that they have. See if they have a diagram that demonstrates to you um, how that works. Um, there's a separate video that talks about a handout from section 1.3. My friends, that is an excellent um, video to look at because everything in there would be a wonderful exam, homework, final exam question. Okay, so make sure you check out that other video for the handout uh, overview on section 1.3. Very, very important. Um, section 1.4, this is about analyzing studies. Um, this is something that, of course, you are free to read on your own. Uh, some other details here. Um, I'm just going to touch on these very briefly. Um, and it's it, this is actually, at the moment, very relevant to me because I'm going to have to do this um, in actually a couple of weeks in the making of this video. Um, so when you have your study and you have it together and, and everybody in your team and group, committee, et cetera, is happy with it, it has to go before an internal review board um, or IRB to make sure that it is ethically sound. And what they're looking for is to make sure that you are providing informed consent to the people who are going to be in the study so that they know what they're getting themselves into and that they're not subjecting anybody to any sort of unnecessary harm. So it is a bit of a long process to fill this out, depending on how uh, your study is designed. Sometimes it's very easy. If it's, let's say, medical uh, related where you're issuing treatments, it's going to be a lot more uh, robust in terms of what they're looking for. So um, there are lots of questions uh, as you read through various studies, um, such as who paid for it, how was the data collected, when was the information collected, who published it, etc. These are things you want to keep in mind when you're reading 
studies. Sometimes you don't want to just take things at face value, especially if you're hearing it on the news. Okay, uh, it's important to know who exactly was involved in the study. What kind of questions did they actually ask? And you're going to do an assignment for me um, where you're going to be looking at some real data. We will be asking some of these questions as well. So um, anyway, there's some some questions here about uh, uh, this headline, America's 100 best companies to work for or top 10 things to make you happy. Um, lots of questions here, right? What do we mean by best company? Who's defining that? Um, I was in a meeting not too long ago where somebody was talking about the best teachers. Well, how do you define the best teachers? Okay. This idea of making you happy, what does that mean? Okay. What makes me happy may be different than what makes you happy. So uh, headlines can certainly be a bit misleading and have different meanings depending on the individual. So um, variables are, are certainly important, right? Uh, what we're trying to measure versus what we're not, uh, what has relevancy, et cetera. So um, we want to try to account for many of the confounding variables as possible. And so when you put experiments and things together, often this involves a good brainstorming session for, okay, what are the variables that we need to con take into consideration? And again, if it's dealing with something medically related, certainly family history, age, geographic region, smoking versus non, um, other medications you're taking all have a, have a factor to play. So Anyway, um, some additional questions here. You're free to pause the video and read through these. Uh, again, just understanding some headlines, something that makes hair 60% smoother. Okay, well, what exactly does that mean? Okay, uh, so again, feel free to pause uh, and, and read through this and, and try to understand some of these questions that are being posed here. Certainly, there could be more too, uh, but anyway. Um, some additional voc uh, vocabulary. The one I want you to focus on here is the bias. Um, that's something that we we definitely do not want. So bias is favoring of a certain outcome in a study. How do you reduce bias? I hope you all were paying attention to that. You use randomization, okay? Um, the other vocabulary here has to do with issues that may come up in the studies, like dropouts, okay? I may have to deal with this in my study. Uh, if I'm doing an interview and somebody says, you know what, I don't want to participate anymore, okay? That's considered a, a, a dropout, all right? Uh, or somebody who does my online survey, but then decides they don't want to finish it. So sometimes these things um, can come up. Same thing with non-adherence. And there's also certain issues with bias uh, for the researcher and the response. So again, this vocabulary, pause the video and give it a read on the previous slides, participation bias, non-response bias, uh, these kinds of things. All are problems um, that can certainly come up. Okay, um, and then we have some other questions about conclusions, okay, that uh, that we tend to state and think about uh, when we look at research studies. So often what will happen in a research study, we, we think about these questions in a limitations section, and I'll have to do this as well um, in my dissertation work where uh, I need to sort of say, okay, I've completed this study, then what are the limitations um, that we had? Are, are, there, are there any other things that somebody could have done differently or I could have done differently? Are there anything that's influencing the results that maybe I didn't think about? Um, that can certainly happen too. That's how we get better um, as researchers. So um, that concludes the chapter one video. So thanks again uh, for watching and make sure again, you watch the section 1.3 um, uh, overview of the handout.